Hello. Oh, good morning. Hello, hello. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Thank you. How are you? Yeah. All right. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is <laughs> through you uh, through Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> better than nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for organizing this. Uh, how are things in Brazil? Is is it uh, must be a bit chaotic, no? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, some some uh, some uh, cities are reducing the flexibility. So, in in my the city I live is. Uh, lock it down so uh, I can only go to the supermarket and other uh, essential uh, uh, activities so it's very hard but uh, we take the advantage to organize some uh, online, online lectures like that <laughs> so to keep uh, us and the students uh, in activities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been doing some of that too as well. I mean, mm -hmm. again, what are you going to do? Otherwise, nothing happens. And still... Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and yeah, I'm also working in some projects. So uh, at the end of the day, we work more than eight hours per day. So <laughs> we're that's more weird. than usual. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true. It's weird, isn't it? The, and people seem to never stop working and send you emails yeah. at midnight. Yeah, and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Uh, here we have... Uh, the majority are students, but we have some uh, researchers that uh, professors as well. Are, oh, nice. So, and there are some students who are um, searching for subject for their thesis, also some methodology. That's why your presentation or lecture is so important for us. Okay, and thanks again for uh, for accepting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime. That's nice. It's always nice to be invited. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, you, uh, the federal university is a great university. So. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, so would you like to to share your screen now? Okay, let me look for where is it. Just a moment. Uh, just a moment. Hmm. Uh, sorry, it's because I opened several PowerPoints and I need to figure out what. <laughs> <I'm doing. laughs> uh, so I was uh, working on the slides just now and. It don't start giving the wrong talk. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Is uh... yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. Zoom behaves strangely. I don't really because I don't see my own slides now. Wait a minute. Ah, uh, okay. Mm. Yeah. Do you have two screens? Yes, I'm gonna unplug the second screen. Yeah, That's usually the the, uh, the presentation is in the, the second screen. So you have to select when sharing the second screen. I'm gonna do it like this. Okay, do you see my ah, slide? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I've got rid of the other screen. So it's, now I know what's going on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that's good. 
Eu vou just uh, introduce you in, in português. So don't worry, I'm going, uh, I'm going to say good things about you. <laughs> okay. And just to announce, and then you can start your presentation. <laughs> Pessoal, bom dia. É, bom, agora a gente vai fazer a apresentação do professor Jean-François Mercury, que é professor da Universidade de Exerté. Eu, eu nunca consigo pronunciar essa palavra direito, Exerté mas ele é um, um grande amigo meu, a gente já trabalhou em alguns projetos juntos, é, e ele tem bastante experiência em modelos de equilíbrio geral, modelos macroeconômicos, é, com foco na área de energia e na área de meio ambiente também. Tá, a, a, o, o, a apresentação também está sendo transmitida pelo YouTube, então quem não conseguir... É, seguir pelo Zoom, eu vou colocar no chat aqui uh, o link, né, de maneira que vocês possam é, acompanhar de lá, caso haja alguma dificuldade. Bom, thanks again, uh, Jean-François. Well, the, the floor is yours. Ok, thank you very much, Amaro. Thanks for inviting. Hello, everybody. Happy to uh, be with you. I can't see you, but uh, very happy to, to, to be there. Um, Amaro said he was interested in, and you'd be interested in, um, topics related to macroeconomics. We do a lot of that, and um, I, I think I, well, I decided I'd recycle a, a piece I've, I presented at Duke University last year, except I've updated it a bit, and um, it was interesting to talk to, to people in the US last year, and, and now it's, it's great to talk to you. So oh, yeah, I'm, I'm at the University of Exeter. In Exeter, we um, have a lot of climate scientists. We have a major number of um, climate scientists, uh, of British climate scientists, and the Met Office is there. So some of you might actually might work with the Met Office, the Hadley Center. Um, but not so many people do the macroeconomics of climate policy. So that's, that's why I ended up uh, here, actually, uh, as uh, I recently joined a year ago. But I also work with uh, uh, Cambridge Econometrics. Uh, some of you might know, I think Amaro said Hector gave a presentation. So yes, Hector, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hector and I work together all the time. In fact, uh, there's, our, our work is inseparable now. There's always our two names on every paper that comes out almost. So, okay. Yeah, there's the team. Um, Exeter, Cambridge Econometrics, University of Cambridge. Uh, Open University is, is, is climate scientists. Um, ironically, I don't work with the climate scientists at, in Exeter because these are older friends than when I moved there. But we work for the UK government as well as the European Commission um, and different funders have, have worked with us. Okay, so I was going to start with this. Um, so that's work that uh, Hector did, and I often use this slide. Um, they had been analyzing uh, the economic impacts of EU, EU uh, climate policy, the long-term energy roadmap. Uh, typically, when they do that, they hire two different teams of modelers. The, the team in Athens, which is quite well known, they have the GEMI-3 model. Um, um, Pantelis Capros and uh, Leonidas Parousos, they have very, they've got very good models there. And there's the other team is ours, uh, at Cambridge Econometrics and, and Exeter. Um, and then we analyze the economic, the macro impacts of policies. And typically, the Greeks with their CG model get slight negative uh, GDP impacts for climate policy. And we get a positive impact. Now, that always puzzles people. But of course, the, the policymakers, they don't like it, but they, they find it not too bad in some sense because it gives them a range. They say, well, it's between well, plus 2% and minus 1%. They think it can't be too bad. I mean, 2, 2%, 3% would be quite quite a bit, but uh, minus 1%, I guess, is, is or less than 1% is reasonable. So they, they can take that as a range, but it's not great that your analysis is opposite <laughs> for the two models. If you had hired only just one model, you would have had something completely different as a picture, right? You, you would have thought this is good or bad. 
Okay. Well, what's the reason? So eventually the commission asked us to look into this. I was in charge of that report and we, we studied that. It's published now in climate policy. I'll put it here. Here there's Hector's paper, the, the role of money and finance at, at the top. And there's my, my paper with Hector, it's just we swapped the names really, um, where we have the results of this study looking at why the models give opposite results. Um, okay, so I'll talk about that. But um, I wasn't just going to talk about that. I was going to talk about more generally, there's issues about using cost benefit analysis or equilibrium macroeconomics to look at the climate problem. And, and I'll, I'll say why. So if you were going to work with cost benefit analysis, like, like that's what you would do in the UK and the US. I don't know in Brazil, um, maybe we can talk about this later, the, how it, what, what people will use, but um, so what you need, if you use cost benefit analysis, you need clear costs and clear benefits. If, if, if the pictures aren't clear, you have an ambiguous answer. And one case that, that could make it ambiguous is if, for example, the costs are negative, or let's say that the costs don't increase with the level of abatement, but the costs start to decrease because of learning by doing or things like this. Okay, so what you need is well-defined mitigation costs, well-defined climate costs. You need these things to meet somewhere. If you use Nordhaus's model, for example, and you need uncertainty that is bounded. You need to know what the uncertainty is and you can't have a uh, long tail uncertainty. Now it'll stop working. Yeah, precisely. If say the cost decrease with the level of ambition, then it starts to, to fail. The, if, um, if the upper bound of, of costs is, is, uh, is not bounded, for example, climate costs are not bounded at the top, that, that's a problem. And if there are unknowns, un, unknown, un, unknowns, if you're not able to have a complete enumeration of the possible outcomes, then your answer is ambiguous. Um, so there, and especially I think they're not the right tools when you talk about innovation because innovation can have precisely these, these effects where you could have um, unbounded uh, or an incomplete list of possible outcomes uh, of your policy. So for example, you've got Germany uh, imposing feed-in tariffs uh, and then it, the Chinese invest in solar energy and then the, the cost of solar go down and then the whole world starts to buy solar panels and then the costs keep going down and eventually it becomes cheap for the whole world and cheap for Germany too. And then they don't have this, they, they can get rid of this feed in tariff, but, and then some people in Germany were saying, this is a failure of policy because it's inefficient. But in fact, it kind of transformed the world of technology. So it, in fact, the costs kept, and now the cost of solar in some places are cheaper than coal, right? And that you could describe with the decision of Germany to impose feed in tariffs. Okay, so imagine Nordhaus's model, you've got your, climate damage is increasing with the level, no, no, so with the level of, uh, of emissions, accumulated emissions. And then the uh, marginal costs that um, increase with the level of ambition with the reducing emissions. And then you think the optimal carbon price would be where these two meet. Now you'd, you'd bring in some level of uncertainty. So you could say the carbon price, the ideal carbon price would be in that little diamond shape in the middle. But what if, what if as, as you reduce emissions, the, the trajectory actually starts to go down in cost? It never meets the climate damages. Then you obviously don't have an answer to cost benefit analysis, right? Well, you could also have something else where actually there are two answers. One, one where um, you do a minimal amount of, of investment and one where you do a lot of investment. And there could be a situation where you could have invested more and it could have led to even lower costs, but you might have got stuck at the what you thought was the optimal point, while there could have been a much better situation out there that you didn't consider existed because you were using a, a simple model. Okay, so that, that's kind of where I think the, the dynamics of technology and finance really have to be kind of understood. I mean, I'm not saying everybody uses Nordhaus's model, almost nobody does, but it's sort of an illustration, right? Okay, and then the last, I guess, important concept I, I wanted to mention is that 
before I really get going is if you have a distribution, a probability distribution of outcomes of um, a decision that is unbounded in the upper range or that is uh, long tailed. If it's long tailed, it means that you try, if you calculate the mean, it has no value, it, it diverges to infinity. That's because there's too much weighting on the upper end of the distribution. Uh, so here you think of the distribution of costs of climate change associated with a certain amount of warming. So the warming is uh, heavy tailed already. Uh, it has a, a longer tail at the upper end. And then if you translated that to cost uh, following Nordhaus's sort of a function of costs, uh, damage function, you, you'd find that actually um, a seven to 10 degree world is infinite cost because the cost is at bi as big as global GDP or something like that, right? But in fact, it's just that um, <clears throat> because you've got too much weighting at the upper end, um, you just um, can't calculate this because uh, you're adding large numbers with small numbers and it just gives an ambiguous answer, right? It's, it's just not, it's not the right thing to do to, so calculating costs with a long tail, but that, that's so the climate gives you a long tail, right? But I think innovation also gives you a long tail because there are many possibilities that come out of your innovation policy. So, okay. Uh, so that's Weizmann's decimal theorem, as it's called. Uh, any, if anybody, if any of you want to know more, I can I can send you material. Okay, and then, but innovation is a complex process. In fact, it's mostly to do with the fact that technologies are connected to technologies. So as you develop electric ba batteries for electric cars, you actually develop all sorts of other applications like household uh, energy storage or maybe grid level energy storage or all of these things kind of come together where you develop one key innovation and then all of these start to go down in cost or in, in availability and it transforms the, the system more than, you know, just having costs, right? So that it's a whole cluster of technology that together evolves and that then becomes very path dependent. It depends exactly on what the history is and how, how you got there. Okay, and then lastly, you'd say it's hard to monetize or calculate or give value to, to the outcomes of policy. Uh, you can have inequality effects, unemployment, uh, regional disparity. GDP is not a good proxy. Well, I'm, I'm sure people in, in Brazil agree with that mostly. GDP is not a good proxy for assessing the outcomes, right? It's just a a, a strange proxy for what is good and bad. It's, it's, it's a measure of something, but not good and bad. <laughs> um, but there's other things, health, life, quality of environment. Um, and then, of course, policymakers need to look at all these things. Um, and But no one can really claim to know the exact outcomes for all of these um, aspects. But you can tell which direction things are taking uh, with a policy. So in some sense, we have an obsession in the field of looking at the end point, the outcome, while what we should look is the direction of change. And that, this is what some colleagues of mine are telling me at the UK government, which I'm starting to think is, is increasingly interesting to think that way. Okay. Um, okay, I was, th this is the rest of the talk. So I'm going to talk about why heterogeneity matters. Not too much because I, I think we want to hear more about finance, but I'll talk a little bit about heterogeneity and different people, how the fact that people are different uh, is important to, to consider. I'll talk about interactions a little bit, so how technology behaves as a kind of complex system. And then I'll, I'll spend more time on the nature of money and finance. And then if I have time, I might not get to talking about uncertainty too much. Probably not, actually. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so heterogeneity matters. Okay, so I've studied uh, with colleagues the um, UK uh, vehicle sector and actually many countries um, and how much people pay for vehicles. It's kind of an interesting thing. You think, well, if we model uh, transforming um, tra the transport sector, we'd think about what would be the cheapest sort of solution for transportation, but actually people when they buy cars, they don't minimize the cost of cars. They 
maybe they maximize the cost of cars actually they buy the biggest car they can afford right they, they so it's it, they all have four wheels and a steering wheel but in fact they're quite different because look at these prices so between twenty thousand to eighty thousand uh, dollars that's like your range so the the width of the distribution of what people buy is as big as the mean right the average and that follows the income distribution sort of that this is not uh, the same data set so it's not really a correlation it just shows that it, it sort of follows that richer people buy more expensive cars um now probably you would think that um richer people emit more emissions per kilometer than poorer people right well poorer people use buses so that's for sure uh, uh emits less not just poorer people but of course some poorer people but so it's a it's an open it's it's a question you could ask. Well, we were looking at that actually. So this is the dis distribution of costs for different types of vehicles. This the dis distribution of emissions that matches this. This is a bit old now, by the way. It's 2015, so it's old data. That we have newer data, but this is the correlation between them. So, yes. So log price at the bottom and emissions linear, um, the vertical axis, and yes, people who pay more for their car emit more per kilometer in the UK. Although it's not always true, not in every country, but it, is, it does seem to follow this. Well, because it's log on the horizontal axis, if you put a carbon price onto road transportation, rich people will not feel the, the tax because it's, it's small compared to the price of the car. Poor people will feel the tax. So if everybody pays the same price for the same ton of emissions, it's not felt the same by rich and poor, right? So I think their heterogeneity matters for your formation of policy. Okay, these are the distributions in different countries, completely different car markets in every country. So that's that's why I think uh, heterogeneity matters. The, the distribution of emissions, it's interesting in the US how much more emissions there are per kilometer than almost every other country. So because they have huge engines in the US compared to Europe, for example. Uh, I've got these, but if anybody wants to see this, I can send the paper. Um, these are the regressions, um, engine size, emissions uh, against engine size, and then emissions against vehicle prices. But okay, I'll, I'll, these are India, Japan, Brazil. So different countries that you see in India, it's, not clear at all. There's not even an R square there. Okay, interactions. Why do interactions matter for um, climate policy? So, <clears throat> uh, typically in models, we assume perfect knowledge. We assume a, a rational expectations and a representative agents, and we assume that um, people respond to prices people don't really interact with one another. But in reality, you know that people interact with one another because they influence each other in buying stuff, right? You know that um, when there's a new innovation, there's early adopters, and the fact that er early adopters adopt the technology allows the early majority to, to adopt it because the early adopters make a demonstration effect that the, the, late ma the early majority and late majority can, can sort of rely on. Right. Now, many people wouldn't adopt something until a whole load of other people have done it already. You think of uh, new types of mobile phones or new types of, um, well, when, when there was a transition between um, the, the old mobile phone and the, the smartphone, it, it took a while before everybody, and eventually everybody has it, right? And you, you don't even see the old technology anymore. But there's another effect going on at the same time. There's the um, <clears throat> companies, when they have a new product is usually expensive to produce because the scale is, is small. And as they get sales, they, they are able to invest in expanding scale, which makes the cost go down. But when the cost go down, it attracts more consumers, which allows them to expand scale more, which makes the cost go down more. And so because you've got early adopters, the price is going down, which also allows the early majority to get the, the technology at lower price than the early adopters. So this also feeds into itself. So, so for example, if you had a subsidy at the early phase, it could drive the cost down sufficiently 
that then you can kickstart the diffusion and then until you get the early majority. But if you didn't have that subsidy to start, maybe this would never have happened because the cost would always have been too high for everybody. And I think that Germany for solar panels did exactly that, right? It was the, the early adopter effect in some sense that drove the prices down so that the rest of the world, late majority, early majority, can, can now uh, sort of uh, benefit from solar. Okay, there's a, this shape of diffusion, which is the, the adoption rate here. This is, this is throughout history, right? This is a use of different types of energy. It always follows a, a set of logistic curves like this. Um, it is the best example is here, the transition between horses and cars in the 20s. I always like to show this because it's, 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 so, it's sort of funny to imagine what, what the world was like before. And people had too many horses at some point, they weren't using them anymore because the transition to cars was so rapid. You can see just a few years, it's only just about 20 years. And then all of a sudden, you, nobody uses horses anymore. It's horse-drawn carriages and then cows replacing them. So that always has that sort of structure. It really is, the more people had cars, the more people were buying cars, right? Okay, and then, well, I don't want to describe this too much, but there's a whole theory in social science about socio-technical transitions that looks at the interaction between diffusion, um, various aspects of society like culture or um, regulation policy um, and then there's a, an overall landscape at the top that sort of controls what overall what's what's going on like population and, and gdp in general and that's that's a good description of really how how diffusion how diffusion works but okay given that um Let's say you wanted to model technological change. If you were going to do a cost minimization for road transportation, you'd think, well, I'm sort of assuming that those rich people are going to try to buy the cheapest car. It's clearly not what's happening. We, we, we look at the data earlier. That's not sure what's happening. In fact, they, in fact the, the richer people sometimes are the early adopters, in fact, they, because they have, more, they have more resources. Well, we, we, you can try to model using S-shaped diffusion curves. So that's something we do in, in, in our team. We, we look at diffusion of technology with S-shaped curves. So what, what it does is it, it's, it's that process where more people buy something, the more it's visible, the more people can buy it, the more it's visible. And it follows these, these dynamics. But first, you need to, to always remember that technology is always changing, has been changing in history. It's never in equilibrium. It's never stable. It changes. So here, uh, what we're doing is adding successive layers of policy to see where that brings the, the, the transportation sector. So you're trying to get more and more electric cars, right? The, the, the sort of purple ones. You've got some hybrids that come in and out because somehow hybrids have emissions and we want to get rid of emissions. And uh, eventually they, they get overtaken by um, electric cars. And you can see how the, the structure of um, old Fossil fuel vehicles disappearing. Uh, we did a similar study for, for the household heating systems in, in the EU. And no, actually, this is the whole world. We did two studies like that. And also household heating systems are changing all the time. And then you can look at how policy changes the direction of, of, that, chain, of, that, of that evolution rather than what the end point is. It's very uncertain what the end point is, really. But technology is already changing. Okay, so here you've got oil bo boilers for houses, um, gas boilers, coal fireplaces, district heating, electric heaters, electric heat pumps, and so on. So that's another example of technology. Okay, now I'll spend more time on, on this. How much time have I got? Because I forgot to check the, my watch. No, oh, you can go on, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, here I'll spend a bit more time. I think that's more, more, I, I get back to this, um, to this, uh, okay. So what, what did uh, we do here uh, when we analyzed the long-term, the EU's long-term energy roadmap? So, um, okay, so here uh, the EU asked us to calculate a number of scenarios of technology evolution and the impacts on the economy. Uh, 
And so the impacts are, are not simple to estimate because they come in many places and technology is all over the economy, right? You don't just have solar panels and coal plants, but you also have vehicles, but also you've got household devices. It's an energy efficiency in industry, for example. So on one end, you've got a model that tells you it's going to cost GDP and the, the, the framing of people there is thinking, well, we're investing a fraction of GDP into low carbon technology to reduce emissions. And um, that's kind of displacing investment that would have gone elsewhere perhaps. And it's, so you, you're sort of investing some of the return of the economy into decarbonizing. But in the other perspective, you, you've got other people who are like saying, well, actually we're building new things. So it employs all these people who uh, might have been unemployed before. And actually because they're working, they're spending money. So actually it raises GDP. Now, why is it that we can have these two perspectives? And in fact, this, these two perspectives are there since about 100 years. <laughs> it's the division in economics that hasn't changed for quite some time. In fact, it's Keynes in the versus, um, uh, well, the old classics, so uh, Hicks and so on, uh, back, in the, back in the 30s, really, uh, until the 50s. And this debate sort of never ended. Okay, so here the, the commission asks us, we're going to have a scenario of high energy efficiency a scenario of diversified energy supply, a scenario of high renewables, one of um, without CCS and one with low, no, low nuclear. So different options to reach a certain um, target and then look at the impacts. The impacts, it's funny, the impacts depend more on the model than on the scenario. <laughs> okay, so here's the, here's the explanation. So that's a, a diagram it's in the paper on in climate policy that I was m mentioning earlier. Okay, so on one side, on the left, you've got the CG equilibrium understanding of um, the economy. I, I have to say, this is the simplest possible CG. So some CG modelers will say, no, we, that's not what we do. We do something much more intelligent. And I believe then the, the Greeks what they do is, is, is quite advanced and they even have a representation of the financial sector in the CG model. It's really a pretty amazing model. But I think the, the basic remains a bit like this, right? This division in understanding the flow of um, money in the economy is, is, um, is very old and has been like that. So in the equilibrium picture, you have a capital stock and you grow that capital stock, right? So capital stock produces, it employs people, people have income, and then people decide between saving and consuming. What they don't consume is saved. What is saved is lent by banks. So that, that little house uh, there with the columns is, is a bank. It's lent to people who invest in expanding the capital stock or improving the capital stock with uh, R&D. And then, yeah, that accumulates on onto the capital stock. You've got your capital accumulation, and you could consider that uh, human capital is capital as well. So, if people study, then they they add to the capital stock, which is human capital. So that's uh, that's the equilibrium picture. In the non-equilibrium picture, what you have, and that's the story from Keynes and Schumpeter from back in back in the twenties. In fact, you've got demand. People with money have demand for products and services. And then you've got entrepreneurs who sense that demand and they want to um, develop new products that will uh, respond to that demand. So they borrow money from the uh, financial institution. They improve or expand the capital stock. And that improves its competitiveness. So there's a price effect. Of course, in, in the equilibrium picture, there's also a price effect, but it's sort of implicit. Uh, yeah. Uh, the competitive, well, peop, well uh, the demand also leads to production, which leads to employment, which leads to income. And after buying the things you normally buy, um, because the economy is more productive, you've got leftover income, which means that demand has increased. And the entrepreneur senses that demand has increased, so he invests more in the capital stock. But 
uh, something to be remembered is that if for any reason demand goes down, that this goes into the reverse uh, spiral. It goes into a downward spiral, just like now with the COVID virus, right? So there's a disruption to demand. It, it, it interrupts this whole cycle. Um, so it's not to do with interrupting the capital stock. It's to do with interrupting demand uh, in, in this picture of the economy, right? Okay, so <clears throat> now what the difference is for um, this picture of the European Commission report? So the difference is uh, here is how we understand finance and it's that little bank with the dollar sign really. So in, on the left, you've got a choice between consuming and saving. So the more you save, the more, the more you consume, the less you save, the less you reinvest in the economy. And you've got a set amount of investment you can put in the capital stock. If you put more in some sector, you have less in other sectors. But on the right, um, there's no stated limit on credit creation, or at least there's not a specific amount to be lent. And it depends on credit worthiness of the people that are lent to. So that's quite a different understanding. So here you've got this effect called crowding outs. That's uh, in the equilibrium picture. When an agent borrows funds to invest into productive capital, this demand diverts funds that would otherwise have been used elsewhere in the economy by bidding upwards the price of finance, which is the interest rate. So for example, for climate change mitigation, you're requiring enormous investment in low carbon capital, say um, wind turbines and solar panels. And this investment takes away a lot of the savings. There's less savings left for investment in other sectors and then other industrial sectors like, I don't know what, um, pharmaceuticals just get less investment because um, it's been taken away and this is mediated by the price of finance, the interest rate. Now the question is, does this happen or not, right? Okay, so, and it depends how you understand how money works. Okay, so if you have crowding out, yeah, investment displaces investment elsewhere, that's what I just said. Uh, typically for a high investment period, GDP, um, well, if you've invested lots in, low carbon capital, you've got less investment elsewhere that reduces uh, economic growth in those other sectors, which overall reduces economic growth in general. If you don't have crowding out, you have low carbon investment that will not displace finance elsewhere. And because it will employ people, it will raise GDP. That's the key difference there. You've got two types of models giving opposite answers. That's just exactly why. And you could say even more investment in R&D, so what increases productivity in the economy is exactly the problem as well. So low, does a low carbon transition in increase productivity it will depend on this, the answer to this question. So we, we had put this picture in the paper. I have to say, I drew this picture with the, the colleagues from Athens and it was interesting because we, we could debate really how the economy works between us. And we, we both believe our own sort of um, perspectives from economics. And I think we're both partially correct, but partially wrong as well. So on the non-equilibrium side, you've got initially for an energy transition an initial growth in GDP that then goes down in the future because you, you accumulate debt and you've got to repay debt back in the future. So when money is created to finance the entrepreneur's activities to expand the capital stock, this is loans, right? It's a pile of loans. Eventually you can end up with enormous loan repayments. So that would drag GDP. So GDP drag happens later. But in the equilibrium picture, you drag GDP immediately at the start because you're displacing finance from other sectors. And this recovers afterwards when you stop doing that. But also you might have improved productivity so you could actually get a better picture in the long term. And so that's, that's why the opposite there. Okay, so um, it's, it's more complicated in reality. You've got another picture. So imagine that there's a sector where in the transition, you stop investing. So the fossil fuel sector, if you stop investing there, in the equilibrium picture, you would free up savings. So you would free up investment and you could invest that elsewhere. So that could be good for the economy. So that's weird. While in the non-equilibrium picture, you'd have the opposite. So if you have 
uh, less investment in, in a sector, well, you, you've got less demand, nobody wants to invest in there, so you're going to have uh, less demand and less investment, and so you're going to have the downward spiral. And so it's the exact opposite effect. So that could be bad for the economy. So if you mix all these things up, so here's is really a complicated map that I've, I'm giving you here. But so imagine you've got a number of policies, okay, that influence the investors and the technology producers. Okay, these people invest in the technology mix of, say, the electricity sector right um because of the policies carbon price so on okay it changes fuel use it changes the electricity price um fuel prices because now people are buying electricity maybe more expensive you've got emissions of course and i want to check what it does to the economy okay one effect is that um that's going to have an uh, a uh, price effects on um, energy. So price effects, if the energy price goes up because of your low carbon transition, this is bad for the economy because it will increase consumer prices, most likely and in industrial prices as well. That will reduce industry output, GDP, employment, income, consumption, industry output, employment, income, and so on and so on. You've got a downward spiral. But at the same time, it, it invests. So it actually is money that goes to build new things and that's going to increase industrial activity through well there's there's an r d path and there's a, an industry output path that raises employment income consumption uh, output employment income consumption and so on so th this counterbalances the number one right number two goes up number one goes down Number three, it's possible that you have a change in, in government spending because of the policies. Number, uh, yeah, the, number three and four, actually. So uh, you, you could reuse the carbon price to reinvest in the economy. So that could be positive. In fact, uh, the carbon pricing could be uh, quite a bit of money. Uh, but then last, you've got um, some sectors are losing activity because they're not producing anymore, like fossil fuels. So everybody working um, on offshore oil, offshore oil rigs um, off the coast stop working, but you've got other people starting to work in making electric cars, for example. So that kind of puts a torsion in the economy where some parts going up, some parts going down. Uh, but also there's a whole uh, international trade of fossil fuels that is so high value that that really changes. So if, if say Brazil exports uh, crude to the US, um, that um, may not necessarily be replaced by some other, um, that loss of export is not necessarily replaced by some other gain in export for Brazil, for example, right? It could be different. Um, okay. Here I'm putting that, it gets really complicated. So that's E3ME, right? E3ME is never simple. It's a massive model. So here I've got a, a two degree uh, transition and I'm looking at GDP impacts and employment impact from a baseline, which is the baseline from the International Energy Agency. So in the International Energy Agency, people believe that in the current trajectory, fossil fuel demand will keep going up. So you've got quite large fossil fuel sectors. And then you have a transition. And so you look at the difference in, in outcome from that. So on the left, you've got fossil fuel production. I took this as an example because I think that's what drives a lot of the changes in the economies. You've got lots of production of fossil fuels. Uh, so you can see some countries um, lose 80% of their fossil fuel production. Well, some of them are just Europe and China, India. They don't really have enormous fossil fuel sectors, but um, some uh, like the US have large fossil fuel sectors and they can still lose 75% of it if there's a really reduced demand for, for fossil fuels. And now I've, I've got two scenarios up above and below. Below it's where the Middle East decides that they will just push a lot of oil into the international market because they want to sell all of their oil. And that, that makes things worse for America. So that I contrasted the two because it makes things a bit worse for, for America and Canada. But it, the two scenarios aren't too different. But in one case, the Middle East loses a that doesn't lose its exports of oil. It keeps producing at the expense of everybody else. 
Okay, for GDP, you can see the differences. So you can see that India and China are gaining GDP because they're building a lot of stuff at the beginning. That's E3ME, E3ME is an unequilibrium model. So that's, that's your directly there, your um, investment stimulus effects. While look at Canada, the US, they're losing. They're losing, why? Because effectively the fossil fuel sector shuts it shuts investment and all of the dependent industries that were uh, going to get investment, they don't get that anymore. There's also an effect through the government where there was going to be income from royalties from oil that are not spent by the government anymore. And that not being spent is um, income that is not spent. Um, so because people are unemployed, say they work for the government and they're unemployed or um, uh, and the US also loses uh, a, lot, uh, a huge amount of employment. That's because the fossil fuel sector has quite a, a big uh, position in those economies. But in economies where the fossil fuel sector doesn't have a big position, it, it matters a lot less. Um, so, okay, and then you've got, say, places like the Middle East, where they're kind of in, in the middle because they're able to, to survive longer. And the difference is they can they're more competitive in their fossil fuel sector, so they don't really lose so much, but they will lose later. Um, okay, so there, there you've got a contrast between different economies. It's not that in E3ME we would say that it always leads to increased GDP. It leads to increased GDP where there's increased investment, and it leads to loss of GDP where there's loss of investment. And then the employment, well, this is just cumulated employment. It just follows the same, the same shape, right? It's, sort of the same. And in fact, you could, you could also say that um, the low carbon investment leads to short term jobs, because once you've built all of that, uh, you don't need to build much more. So you can see the wavy shape for, for, for India, is it India, yeah. That actually is new, new runs, I, I, ran, I ran them uh, yesterday, I ran them just a few days ago, actually, because we're working on something like that. So uh, Brazil is not there. I took it out because the results were uh, unstable and uh, it did, didn't work. It was uh, nonsensical. So the rest of the run is not so good. <laughs> I can send an update another time <laughs> once we fixed it. Okay, but that's an example, right? I think that tells you. Okay, so there, there you go. Macroeconomic impacts of uh, climate policy. Uh, countries are affected not just by domestic policies, but by other countries. Um, so the whole international markets matters. Um, in an equilibrium model, you'd see crowding out effects dominate. So you'd have mostly, you can only have negative impacts on GDP. Uh, well, it's maybe more complicated, but in many simple models, that's, that's what you can get. In an unequilibrium model, you'd see more trade effects happen, at least because the fossil fuels have such a, a large part of the global economy, getting rid of it leads to trade effects a lot. Um, renewables are more sort of evenly distributed across the world. That's partly the story. It's not the whole story, but it's, it's kind of partly that. Um, so if you just have, like in Nordhaus, only negative impacts of climate policy, it's too simple. Um, you always have some positive impacts of innovation anyway, because that increases productivity in a country. So you always, you have to have that. In Nordhaus, it's, it's just not there, right? Um, money invested in, in mitigation doesn't disappear. So it's money that's spent by somebody. And I think, in, again, in Nordhaus's model is too simplistic, the, the, the circular flow of, of the economy. Um, trade effects are important, equilibrium or not, right? Because, I mean, in, in the, our Greek friends uh, CG model, you also have an enormous uh, impact through trade that's happening. And that, that's there too. Um, so it will affect US GDP, the fact that China adopts electric cars. That, 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 that uh, wh whichever model you use, you should see that sort of thing, right? Um, but one should calculate debt though. The government debt can, can, be quite, can become quite high uh, for two reasons. One is you could have the government investing in, in low carbon technology, but that's not the worst. The worst is if you're Canada and you're losing all of that economic activity because people aren't demanding fossil fuels anymore, what you do, you go in deficit spending, just like we're doing now with COVID-19. And that's money borrowed. And so one, one should really calculate that. It's quite 
it's not that simple. In fact, I don't think anybody in Canada would let GDP slip down as far as what I showed in the earlier graph, because they would go in deficit spending. They would go in debt to revive or create a new sector of the economy or something like that. Uh, but it's okay. Private debt is, is another thing that matters because this is what leads to financial crisis. So people spending more in a, in reality doesn't lead to taking away money from uh, taking a part of GDP. It leads to accumulating private debt. Private debt leads to in financial instability. Um, and the investment stimulus creates economic activity at the expense of incre increasing debt. This is what's going to happen now with the response to COVID-19, right? We're just going to have absolutely enormous public debt. Public debt is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a problem if it leads the country towards um, loss of investment, investor confidence. Um, if people have doubts that the government is able to maintain the, the, the value of the currency, for example. So that is more of the problem. It's not so much GDP itself. Okay, so that's kind of what I was going to say about the macroeconomics. Um, do I still have time? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just yeah, a few more. Do. Sorry? I'm going. Because <laughs> I forgot my watch somewhere. Okay. Um, I was going to talk about the strategy for policy making. Uh, this is interesting. It's something that I've developed with a colleague at UK government, and we are proposing this somehow. If, because the UK works with cost benefit analysis, and for the reason that I just gave, it's a problem. And it's not like people don't realize it's a problem. What, what cost benefit analysis is, is a set of guidelines that the government has to use to analyze policy before sending it to parliament for adoption, right? If whatever, in whichever country you are, in whichever uh, analysis is done, there, there is an official process for processing say scientific and economic, uh, whatever evidence to underpin the decisions. And it's gonna be created by models and models are themselves um, flawed in many ways, but they are the evidence you've got. But if the framework for analyzing um, information forces you in a certain direction, it's, it's potentially limiting the, the way you can do policy making. So cost-benefit analysis leads to problems when you have a negative costs, when you have uncertainty, when you have um, complex dynamics. Um, okay, so then I was going to talk about uncertainty a little bit. In fact, what we're doing is in the UK, we're considering proposing to use something called a risk opportunity analysis. So instead of cost-benefit analysis. And it's sort of an acknowledgement that you have uncertainty. And it, it, if you have uncertainty, I'd call it fundamental uncertainty, you could say, we're looking at the direction of change, not the end point. Uh, you could say, we are aware that adopting a certain policy could send the economy in a certain direction, but we can't say exactly where it would go, but we can say it's the right direction, something like that. And you could say, uh, it increases risks of financial instability. It increases risks of uh, the climate, the climate damages. It increases risk or decreases risks of climate damages. Um, or it increases risks of poverty, inequality, uh, because you can never be completely sure. Okay, so how, how would that work? I'm going to try to fix the problems of cost-benefit analysis for you. <laughs> and maybe maybe it's useful for, for people in, in whichever... Um, setting of, of policy making, let's say. So I have to learn in Brazil actually how the process works in government. I'd be quite curious. Um, okay, so imagine um, imagine the state was to think it, it, it was going to behave like a company in terms of its view of investing in R&D. What do companies do? I, I dug out this paper recently, uh, Kling Peel and Rammer, the German, I think, um, strategic management journal they say, they analyzed a huge data set of companies in Europe. They say there's evidence that um, companies become more successful when they invest in R&D. Okay, that's kind of the basics, but in fact, it's, it's more complicated. It's companies are successful when they have a good combination of 
investing in many different things, breadth of, of investment. So different types of projects to hedge risk, right? They have commitments to R&D. So what they invest in, they carry, they bring it to term, but they have a good selection mechanism where they're happy to kick out projects that don't seem to lead anywhere. So companies that do this tend to have good return on investment in general. Um, and more generally, you say a company not investing at all in innovation will fail because it will eventually become obsolete. So that's the graph there, like low R&D investment. Too high R&D investment would lead to um, potential strategic mistakes and, and an accumulation of them, which means that you, you could lose too much money on too many projects because there's too much uncertainty. So you think in general, there should be a middle ground where where you want to be. So if you were going to do an analysis of opportunity for investing in R&D, you'd think there's a kind of um, healthy middle ground for R&D investment. But where is that is, is kind of the big question. Now, if the state is an entrepreneur and thinks we will subsidize R&D investment for low carbon innovation to drive the transition, is that good for the economy? It depends, right? And that's, I think, the big question many people need to answer. Okay, at the same time, you can look at how companies view uncertainty. Uncertainty is not just bad, it's not just risk. Uncertainty is also opportunity. Because imagine if there was no uncertainty, no companies could make any money. In fact, uh, venture capitalists could never make any money because they make money out of, um, out of uncertainty, really. They make money out of looking for projects that look um, promising and bringing them to fruition. And they, what they invest in, nine companies out of 10 go out of business and then the 10th one makes the big money, right? And that somehow keeps them afloat. So they're good enough that they, they, they manage to have enough wins compared to all the losses. So a company will look at the future and have a range of uncertainty bounds and will keep readjusting its decisions as, as time passes. So as time passes, so you've got your cone of uncertainty looking at the future. And as time passes, you've got a realization and then a new cone of uncertainty, right? And so uncertainty reduces to zero and then you've got a, and because the economy is path dependent, well, you, you, you can have your, expectations also become path dependent and, and every moment people reassess their um, strategy, right? So in fact, everybody uses uncertainty uh, in their decision-making uh, as time passes. Uh, in fact, nobody would want the future to be predetermined. And the same, I think, for, for policy. So policy, you'd have to put, for climate policy, I think you'd have to put yourself in the shoes of an entrepreneur and thinking, I've got to invest in these various possible uh, technologies um, and then see what happens, which one is best. And then I'll, I'll kick the other ones out and keep that one and keep, you know, diversifying and diversifying and kicking out projects. Right. Okay. So, so here's the kind of proposal because you can't form probability distributions for what the outcome is of GDP, for example, or um, return on, on investment in certain ventures, but you, you have an idea with the models, what the, what the direction of things is. You can tell where things are going with a certain amount of investments in certain technologies. Okay, so you can't take like Nordhaus, you can't take expected values. You can't say the average of the outcome is this and that. What you can say is um, there's a, a kind of general direction things are taking and there's risk that's accumulating in the system. And then you can, you can tell whether the risk is too much and whether the direction is the right thing. And these are two different things, right? So with my friend in UK government, we were thinking, um, you can think of three types of functions in government, three types of people. You've got the strategists, they want to see where things are going. You've got the regulators want to know that things are stable. And you've got accountants, they want to know how the government resources are allocated, right? So you, can look at the risk part, that's for the regulator to check that uh, we're not driving the economy towards uh, financial instability, for example, by having too much debt or uh, having an unstable electricity sector because you've got too much intermittency in renewables. 
but you can you can also the 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 accountant can tell whether um, uh, the treasury uh, it can afford the transformations that are happening, and the strategist can tell whether it's going in the right direction. But lastly, you can also look at what opportunities there could be in the economy that are generated by your investments, and these uh, these are also uh, very uncertain. So they're kind of the opposite of tail risk. They're like the tail opportunity. And so we're writing this paper that we're going to uh, sort of share with people in government. We'll see what they think. It's very new, right? But here's the, the difference in thinking. So imagine in the equilibrium picture, typically people would say, you're going to tax the externality and it's going to give you a new equilibrium, right? In your uncertainty, you tend to think it's parametric uncertainty and you can give an uncertainty range to where the outcome is. But in reality, I think that's underplaying uncertainty. Uncertainty is long tail. You probably don't know all the possible outcomes. But if you have a, a non-equilibrium non dynamical economy, what you're going to have is things like diffusion uh, makes costs go down, which makes diffusion go up, which makes costs go down. And so the costs are com continuously changing. And then you put your policy in and it just accelerates things. So you get a new direction of, of travel with lots of uncertainty. And so you can look at how things are changing direction by creating all these different scenarios of, of where things could go. And then because you've got too many things going on in the economy, you've got long tailed uh, distributions of outcomes and you've got to live with that, right? So that's where you do your risk opportunity assessment. I think this is more a more clever way of using information that's available in your policy, in your climate policy. <coughs> so, I mean, what I was giving about talking about GDP in the earlier graphs, it's so complicated. You can't be sure this is correct. Right? I think we could tell which direction it's taken. OK, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of it, really. Um, so I was going to say. Too many complex things give heavy tails, so you should assume that you've got heavy tails. And you can, as part of a risk opportunity assessment, you could look at uncertainty, mul mul multiple dimensions, risks, benefits. And then lastly, I think this is cool, the concept of externality really is systemic risk. I think of the COVID uh, situation, right? When, when you see some, some guy going to party with some kids in the street, what you think is, uh, is really bad because he's increasing everybody's risk of catching the disease because he's gonna go back home and give that to his parents and then and so on and so on. And that's gonna increase uh, the load on the health system. What is, but you can't be sure he's gonna catch the disease. That's the thing. So you can't be sure what the contribution is. What we can say is that he increases, he contributes to society-wide systemic risk. So your externality really is systemic risk. It's the, it's the risk that everybody has of catching the disease. And when you think of what the government's been doing by, by imposing lockdown, is they've been trying to minimize systemic risk. They're not minimizing costs or benefits. They're minimizing systemic risk. They're already doing risk opportunity assessment, in fact. It just doesn't have a name, right? So um, well, that's it. I was going to just conclude with this. Learning from decades of neoliberal policy. Um, innovation starts at universities, not with entrepreneurs. And it's, it's really where the, the heart of, of creation is. And by that can have leadership because universities are publicly funded. So we have leadership in creating the new economy, right? And government is the largest venture capitalist or should be. And uh, free markets lack technological leadership. In fact, it just kind of leads nowhere while direction can come from the government for the direction of innovation. The unknown is often good in innovation systems and no progress is made without um, the ultimate role of the venture capitalist, which is the government. Yeah, that's it, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for this inspiring presentation. So, uh, if you are okay with that, I can open the floor for questions. So you can uh, open the, the microphone and uh, make the question right in the chat. And then I, uh, uh, I ask the question to, to Jean-Francois. Uh, 
why or waiting to um just some some comments because um uh, we did some studies using uh some general equilibrium models uh but mostly static models and we are always looking for um some measures uh that could get a, a double dividend. So I think Carolina Grotter is there. It was her, uh, her, her thesis. And the idea is to analyze some policy, for example, using the money coming from carbon tax uh, to kind of green check or or reducing yeah. the the uh, uh, the cost of uh, labor, so and it, of course we we also split in different income classes to analyze classes by classes, uh, and we could find one measure that could uh, come to a double dividend, so. But anyway, there is a, a, a role, a role for the government to play in order to get this um, double dividend. So when you say that, but of course, general computable general equilibrium model has some hypothesis. It's very strong for us, for example, the. Uh, uh, perfect competitive markets in in developing countries yeah, we are very far from something like that so that's why we prefer to use some non equilibrium models and and uh, and the result you showed uh, is just uh, show us that uh, First, the, the the role of the government. So, so this uh, the the market itself doesn't uh, solve our problem. So we need the government, uh, not only in this situation uh, of lockdown, um, but also to improve the innovation as uh, venture capital, as as you you said. So. This is very, very interesting result. So does anyone want to, to make some questions? Oh, if it doesn't have any questions, you, you want to make some comments, some, some final comments? Yeah, I was gonna, on what you just said, I was gonna say, <clears throat> Well, it's not like uh, the non-equilibrium model that we use or that we, the theory we've got, it's not, it's not like we, we have the final sort of ultimate theory. And in fact, the debate we have with the Greeks, I think is, is, a, is the most amazing thing because we, we really question everything, right? They can, they can really question us, we can really question them and eventually we learned a lot from that. So mm -hmm. first, in CG models that don't have a financial sector, you get a completely different outcome than if you do have a financial sector. And what happens in your CG model is you're, you're shuffling money uh, around between the future and the present. So effectively your savings go, go to the future, well, you're borrowing money from future um, agents. And that, that changes the, completely changes the picture for crowding out, right? So first that, that really matters, but not many people have CG model with um, finance because it's quite complicated because you, you need to optimize including uh, people's f future sort of um, well you need to you need to optimize in a setting where future people repay their debts mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, sure. so but that, at the same time us we don't really model too well the credit worthiness so everybody gets finance which is also not correct Right, so in some sense, we're we're at the two ends of a spectrum. We should be in the middle somewhere, and I, I do believe the ultimate model would be somewhere in the middle. Now, what you say about uh, double dividends—that's that's, that's going to be positive in 
both types of models, you will you always, but in reality, um, income from carbon pricing will always be spent somewhere unless the government pays that back. If the government pays that back, it's not spending it. That's really bad for GDP, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Government paying back debt is, is not ideal for GDP, but sometimes the government has to do it. That's, that's, the, that's the picture. But if, you, if it doesn't, then it, it's spent on something. Ideally, if it's spent on produ productivity increasing activities, that leads to a better long-term outcome. So that's yeah. great. If it's spent on bailing out uh, fossil fuel companies or um, just paying people for doing nothing, that gives you less long-term productivity improvement. So that, that then becomes a, another sort of key assumption that, that, that you've got to make. Um, for COVID-19 now, governments are spending money just for the sake of it so that people don't just like go into poverty, right? And uh, they're paying companies so that they don't completely um, lay off all their workers. They're just paying them to do nothing, which is, of course, very expensive. Yeah, sure. But eventually, what they need to decide to do is, are they going to bail out high carbon companies? Are they going to bail out airlines? Are they, you know, and... If not, it's terrible for these people. If if they do, they're going to shut them down again later. So, with, well, if they have, for those countries who have climate targets. <laughs> yeah. You know, our <laughs> Minister of uh, Economy got his PhD in the University of Chicago. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> you could have this conversation with him. <laughs> the problem, he, he never hear anybody <laughs> yeah but yeah it's nice to hear some this uh, point of view <laughs> yeah, because it's not like that that the, the economy works no uh, it's, I think I think the previous administration had better economists um, yeah yeah <laughs> despite all the problems the, the well the previous previous let's say the uh, the the Way back with the labor, labor government you had, <clears throat> mm. uh, they, they had some interesting people uh, doing the economic advising. I've, I've, I've heard of some of them. But mm -hmm. of course, and in Brazil, there are many, there's a whole diversity of economists. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not uh, in the government. <laughs> not no. in the government. <laughs> well, not anymore, let's say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it comes with the type of government, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think there is a, one question. Uh, because Rodrigo opened his uh, mute his microphone. Yeah, hi. Thank you for your lecture. I would like to to make a question for you. That a, a really good uh, topic or for discussion. And uh, I was thinking that recently we saw a move from the companies looking for ESG. Um, that is like an altruistic way to think, or or it's a market drive from governments. What do you think about this this, this point? Uh, yes, do you mean the you mean the corporate governance? Do you mean the rules for companies uh, in investment? Y yeah, the rules of, the rules for investment. The like uh, the EMSCI uh, index, like they make in financial markets. So they are starting to look that to some sometimes to attempt the the rules of the the countries, but sometimes trying to, to look uh, long-term for the companies. So this is from the market, this is out-risk way to think. How do you see this this, this point? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm certainly not against. Um, say, I'm involved in a discussion over here, which I didn't talk about, but it's the systemic risk from the transition. So it's, it's the fact that if people keep investing in high carbon capital, and if you have a transition, there is going to be lots of financial losses. Um, so, and if that happens, there could be a financial instability. Uh, and that's a debate between central bankers. So that, that's kind of parallel to what you're saying, but it, it come, I'll come to that. So the point is, there's rules for, the rules are developing for companies to better decide how they invest considering uh, a wider range of, of, of uh, elements. When people invest sort of ethically to look at um, reducing emissions, there's also a component 
investing towards lower risk. I mean, not so long ago, people could still question this, whether there could be risk in financial uh, in the financial sector due to fossil fuels. I think since a, a month or two, nobody questions that anymore. Now you've got, you've had a negative oil price recently. <laughs> this is where yeah. people were paying for other people to store the oil because they had nowhere, it had nowhere to go. There was too much oil for the system to take. This is unprecedented. I mean, imagine. So now if there's risk and much higher risk than people used to think in, in fossil fuels, then people now need to start to consider that risk. Um, if fossil fuel investments are at the top of pension funds, it's a problem because these are pensions. It's too risky for pensions, right? So now you need to reshuffle everything. I think I think uh, it, the, the market will deliver some of that as information comes in, of course, and I think there needs leadership as well. So I really am for every all the discussions that are about corporate governance and um, say disclosure and so on, transparency. Um, this is excellent, but everybody in finance tells me whenever I've talked to people in investment, they say that that doesn't does not replace climate policy. So that's not going to drive the transition. It's just going to avoid the risk that comes with the transition. Oh, that, nice, nice. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Rodrigo. Is there any other question? So, oh, thanks again, uh, Jean-Francois for the inspiring presentation. I think this will uh, help our, all of our students to decide which methodology, which uh, subject they can uh, choose for their thesis. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. You know, Amaro, we've always uh, wanted to find money to work together and never, <laughs> never managed uh, yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should do. And uh, But it, if any of, of you guys want uh, anything from us, we, we're really, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll provide you anything you need and uh, it'd be nice to get to work together one day and uh, <clears throat> on these questions. Yeah. So if you have questions, uh, just send me emails and I'll, I'll forward uh, anything that, that you might need. Nice, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, nice to see you all. Thanks very much. Yeah, au revoir. Okay, au revoir. <laughs> see you next time. Jeez. Yeah, <laughs> ciao.